Good day to you from New York, from Columbia Business School, from the Columbia Institute for Telemotion. My name is Dr. Leon Perlman, and I want to welcome you to yet another of the uh, webinar series from the DFS Observatory uh, at uh, Columbia Business School, CITI. Uh, our presenter today is Mr. Costa Perrick of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, we're going to talk about a very interesting initiative from the foundation called uh, Level, Level 1. So just some housekeeping notes. Uh, please keep your microphone off and video, please, this just to stop any feedback or ambient noise that might uh, um, disturb the participants and presenter. And please don't ask any questions by audio at any time. There will be an opportunity to send questions towards the end of the presentation to the moderator host via the chat box. And you'll see the moderator is Michael Weschler. You should see him in the chat screen. You can actually start sending uh, questions towards the end. Uh, uh, and um, we'll collate the questions for, for Mr. Perrick. So today's agenda, it's a one hour total commitment to time if you're not doing the quiz. Uh, with a quick introduction to the observatory and to Costa, then uh, the live webinar. Again, send questions to the moderator, the host, um, no audio at the end of the presentation. Then we're going to do two quick polls for about 45 seconds, and then we're going to have a live 15-minute uh, Q&A. And for uh, regular participants, you'll know that there's an optional live quiz. And if you didn't, it's a 10-question multiple-choice quiz just after the Q&A ends. And look out for the quiz link in your email and check your spam folders. It's only live for two hours for certificate purposes. Um, and after two hours, the quiz results will not count for certificate purposes. So um, please look out for that. So a bit about the observatory. We uh, have been funded by the uh, foundation and been around since uh, last year, so relatively new. Um, this is the DFS webinar team uh, behind the scenes. Uh, um, Professor Elie Noam, he's the head of CITI. Again, I'm Dr. Leon Perlman, I'm the head of the DFSO. Mike Wesley is the technical guru and also research scholar at DFSO and the webinar moderator to send questions to. And we also have Jason uh, Bikewright, who is the director at CITI. So a bit of our activities, um, we have a database which you can go see, a legal and regulate, regulatory database online, um, model laws and regulations. We have an annual summit, a uh, very successful two-day affair. Uh, webinars, we, these are growing in popularity. Some roundtables, one coming up in November on de-risking. Uh, some publications and commentaries and analysis of new laws and regulations. And we're very involved in the DFS community around the world. Um, and uh, collaborate with uh, SSBs, regulators, academics, and donors. So a bit about our uh, webinars coming up. Um, you'll see that coming up on October 10th is Competition Aspects of Digital Financial Services, Introduction to Paper Technology on October 19th, October 26th, Reg Tech and Reducing in Financial Inclusion, uh, in November 8th, uh, de-risking the impact on financial inclusion. We're also planning one on November 22nd on infrastructure security and DFS. So j just to say something about the, the webinar participation, as I said, we've this is growing in popularity, um, and uh, you'll see a poll question reflects that because what we found is that um, a number of people are participating in the webinar in, in a room. So up to 20 people are watching the webinar uh, at, at one time in one lo location. So we've got a poll at the end of the, uh, uh, the presentation. So whoever's in the room, uh, please just go to your computer. If you're out of 20, just one person go and participate in the poll, please. We'd really appreciate that. Okay, uh, but about the certificate, um, again, uh, attend six webinars, and you need to get 60% for each post-webinar live quiz. Again, if you participate uh, in the webinar, you, you, you would, you'll be able to uh, pass the test quite well, but you have to concentrate on the slides, not, not necessarily what's, on, what's said. You have to concentrate on the written aspects um, of the presentation. So... On to Costa, um, he's going to talk about the overview of the uh, Level 1 platform. And Costa is the Deputy Director of Financial Services for the Poor Division at the Gates Foundation. He leads a team that focuses on financial inclusion 
and digital payments, where he oversees the strategy and grants to deliver secure, reliable, and affordable financial inclusion. Uh, he's also co-founder and leader of InnoTribe, a SWIFT initiative um, to enable collaborative innovation in the financial industry. He's also the chief uh, was also the chief architect of SwiftNet, and he's also the author of The Castle in the Sandbox. And there's his Twitter address. So uh, handing handing over to you, Costa in Brussels. Thank you very much, Leon. Uh, indeed, uh, hello to everyone from sunny Brussels today, which is great. Um, and uh, let us talk about uh, the level one project. Um, so I'm going to co uh, concentrate today on um, descri describing to you what is level one project and um, uh, essentially uh, get you the vision behind it, the details, uh, some details about um, the actual principles it is based on, uh, aspects of deployment of level one project in the countries, a short, very short glimpse of economics, and then a little bit about our regional work. Um, so let's dive in uh, right away. So, uh, um, before we actually describe level one project, let me uh, draw a, the big picture context uh, for you about payment systems. Um, and this particular chart here, which is sourced from SWIFT, um, shows a classification of payment systems depending on uh, two uh, factors, time criticality of payments and the size of payments, meaning the uh, value of the payments. So on the size, we have low value, high value payments. And on the time criticality, we have batch payments in batches and single payments. Um, so to, to uh, walk you through this, if we look at payment batches for low value, this is typically uh, in uh, financial systems done by so-called ACHs, automated clearing houses. Uh, at the opposite uh, side of the spectrum, uh, where we have high value single payments, typically interbank, they are done through an infrastructure called RTGS, real-time growth settlement. Um, the, the topic we will talk today about is really about single payments, low value, uh, which, which is in fact the target segment of um, financial inclusion efforts, of course, because we are talking about very low value payments uh, done uh, all the time in, uh, in, in real time. And so this segment is the segment of real time retail payment systems and level one project is positioned in, in that particular segment. In formulating the level one project principles, we have looked um, uh, and consulted a number of uh, uh, stakeholders that are active in this segment. Notably, uh, for example, the UK's faster payment scheme, uh, Canada's Interact scheme, Mexico's Pay, uh, Peru's BIM. So Level 1 project, um, as you will see, is really a kind of like a um, uh, concentrate of good practices that we have formulated um, in a way that is adapted and adequate to serve very poor, poor people in remote locations in Africa and Asia. So what is the level one project? Uh, and we tend to abbreviate it uh, with this acronym L1P. Uh, very often by abbreviation, we talk about level one too. But um, uh, first of all, why is it called level one project? Um, it's actually the composition of three ideas. Level is level playing field. You will see that level one project is all about interoperability and federating financial service provider in a level playing 
interoperable field. One stands for one economy serves, that serves everyone, benefits everyone, uh, which is very much related to financial inclusion. And project conveys the meaning of uh, finite in time. So this is not something that um, will last forever. We, we want this to be a very concentrated effort uh, and to essentially get it behind us by connecting the 2 billion people uh, estimated today that are unbanked. Um, so level one project, first of all, is, as I mentioned, it's envisioning a digital payment platform, um, first of all, that's it, that is interoperable um, and that therefore federates uh, financial service providers, either existing ones like banks, but also new ones like mobile money operators and other digital financial service providers in a single seamlessly interoperable system and it is based on design principles so we will talk about this principle in a, in a second uh, the second thing that level one project is is kind of like a blueprint of how a system uh, with these characteristics can be configured and operated within a country or a region we will see that the most efficient from the financial inclusion perspective deployment of real-time payment platforms aligned with level one project is really at a country level uh, that's the most impactful but we'll see towards the end of the presentation that um, that uh, also uh, we have efforts going on on regional level in africa for example and then the third thing that uh, Level 1 project is, it's a set of tools and resources that uh, the Gates Foundation uh, publishes on a global good basis. Uh, so um, uh, assets and resources that are available on the level1project.org website. Any and every learning and um, uh, document that we ever publish is available to everyone for use. Our intent really by doing this is that um, essentially any country uh, or community in any, um, in any region can embark on digital financial inclusion without necessarily needing a lot of help from outside. So ultimately we hope that these principles and assets will be available and, deploy, and, and that many people will use it on their own without necessarily requiring uh, specific help from the foundations and partners. Here we can see uh, in a graphical form uh, and short form the, uh, how this payment platform looks like. Um, and as you can see, um, the first apparent characteristic of it is that it stands in the middle of several key uh, systems on the left hand side we see of course the incumbent banking industry with the bank accounts which uh, is of course present in many of the countries where we work but that does not provide yet uh, uh, financially inclusive solutions uh, on the right hand side, we see uh, the mobile money wallet platforms that are uh, numerous and uh, quite pervasive in Africa and some countries in Asia. Um, and today, many of these mobile money platforms are um, non interoperable. So while they provide benefits on their own, um, no. Uh, like for example, M-Pesa in Kenya or Bcash in Bangladesh. Ultimately, if we want to achieve full financial inclusion, we will need to interconnect these mobile money, system, mobile money systems between themselves and to connect them to the bank accounts as well. Um, because essentially and mathematically, a single provider, however powerful they are, will never manage to include 100% of the population. As, as well, what we try to achieve uh, by interconnecting all of these systems together is to provide choice and competition 
because one of the key factors, of course, of the acceptability of payment platforms by the poor is, of course, the cost of using them and the accessibility. Um, so these are the two key uh, uh, stakeholders, but certainly not uh, all of them. On the top side of the picture, we see a number of institutional payors or payees that are very important in this picture. Uh, governments in many countries in Africa and Asia are, one, are the source of numerous payments, uh, notably, of course, um, uh, salaries and pensions, but also many, many uh, social support programs across Africa and Asia. And as such, so governments are a, a huge payor and uh, digitizing and onboarding these, uh, these payments uh, is uh, hugely beneficial and, and is a huge bootstrap to digital payment platform economies because it provides essentially the input of money into digital form. On the other side, we have uh, schools and utilities, which are the destination of numerous regular payments. Um, for school fees and for, of course, uh, utility payments uh, such as electricity. So uh, connecting these stakeholders on the platform is going to be hugely beneficial. Last but certainly not least, once the money is in digital form in the platform, it's necessary to be able also to spend it digitally. Um, and this is where the merchants come in. It's very important to be able to use money in digital form. Our vision of success of financial inclusion is that um, money becomes and stays digital as much as possible, as opposed to scenarios like over the counter where money becomes digital for a few minutes before being cashed out immediately. So this picture shows the um, the overall ecosystem that uh, Level 1 project seeks to, to interconnect. Let us now dive in into the principles uh, that uh, we have uh, enumerated and collected that will make such a system adapted and adequate to serve the poor. The first one we have already mentioned, uh, I have already mentioned several times, uh, uh, it's called open loop system. It, of course, it allow it allows interoperability. So it's very important, as I mentioned, that all financial service providers be interconnected because that's the only way we will be able to reach uh, the poor in rural areas um, by uh, connecting the the players who serve these people into the system. Um, that's the open loop system, as I mentioned, is also important to provide choice and variety of services because not even though um, the poor segment, um, uh, you know, the poor in this segment uh, ha are poor, they have numerous needs. So this segment of, of the poor is actually quite varied and quite diverse, and it's important to be able to cater for all of these needs by connecting all, uh, adequate uh, financial service providers into the system. The second uh, set of principles uh, talks about the, the nature of payments themselves. Um, and we talk there about real-time or near real-time payments, push payments, and irrevocable payments. So let me explain each of these terms in sequence. Uh, real time, um, of course, that means that across this system, from the user perspective, set, uh, payments are settled immediately. If I'm a poor person purchasing something at a merchant, my account or mobile money wallet is debited immediately, the merchant account is credited immediately, the transaction is irrevocable, and cannot be undone in the system. It can be, of course, undone um, by negotiating outside of the system, but from the system's perspective, the payment is irrevocable. 
that the reason for uh, irrevocability is essentially to keep the cost of this system down. Uh, as we have, as I have mentioned, it's very the economics and the cost to the user is very important. If we want poor people to use it, the cost has to be zero or near zero. Uh, and therefore, keeping the cost down of these uh, of the level one project aligned system is very important. Irrevocability provides a huge, um, uh, a huge advance in this way. Real time, of course, has to do with the needs of the poor. And as in many use cases, we are essentially replacing cash. Um, therefore, the transaction has to be um, uh, real time. Uh, otherwise, people would simply not trust it uh, and, uh, and would not use it. Finally, um, and this requires perhaps a little bit more explanation, the push payments. So push payments need essentially need, mean volunteered payments. So me as a pay, payee, I volunteer the payment to, to uh, the vendor or merchant or counterparty as opposed to scenarios which perhaps in the Western world we are used where the, the merchant or vendor would request uh, my information and then would directly interact with my bank to, uh, to uh, get the money out of my account. Uh, this is very cumbersome. This implies sharing a lot of information and uh, is subject to many cases of fraud, push payments, where uh, a person essentially volunteers the amount and the account where it comes from uh, are much more efficient and uh, resistant to fraud. The next set of principles have to, has to do with uh, the governance and settlement in the system. Uh, the, the notion of settlement between providers is very important. As we mentioned, while transactions are settled immediately between users, of course, if these users are across different, are served by different providers, then of course the providers themselves have to settle um, in the banking system, in the underlying banking system. So um, the principle says that. Um, settlements between providers should be same day or uh, actually, if possible, uh, even faster than same day. The reason for this principle is that um, as we have numerous new players that will come in into the system to serve the poor, we don't want the system's risk to increase by uh, allowing inter-provider settlements to, to, and therefore net positions to grow too much that would expose the overall system to a huge risk. So same day settlement is um, one principle, but in fact, we have seen like, for example, the SPAY system in Mexico settles between providers every couple of seconds, actually five, six seconds, which is much better and reduces the risk uh, on, of the, um, of the overall system. The next uh, principle is, is about governance. So uh, it is important that um, there is a collaborative environment between the providers where uh, the, the, uh, uh, the governance and who can do what and who can participate is actually governed by the participants. This creates a feeling of fairness uh, among the participants, it's a quite uh, important and somewhat tricky uh, principle to implement. If you think about, for example, banking communities and telco communities, they may not necessarily uh, want to work together. So, so uh, this principle um, um, is not to be neglected. The next one has to do with cost recovery. So if there is an interoperable platform serving all of these players, um, we deem that the, the platform is not uh, something that is run on a for-profit basis, 
but it's really more operated on a cost recovery basis like a utility. So essentially, it's an industry utility serving the industry. Any profit that is generated should be used to enhance the utility and not uh, for distribution to um, investors or, um, or, or shareholders. Uh, finally, and, and the most perhaps advanced uh, principle is the shared investment principle uh, that uh, is best illustrated when we talk about fraud. Uh, fraud management in digital financial systems is m very important um, and it's also quite tricky to implement. So if uh, we were to uh, impose on all players to do their own uh, fraud management. Uh, the system would be as strong as the weakest of these implementations, and the system would be hugely expensive. So we advise that uh, the system should run on a shared uh, investment basis, especially when it, uh, it applies to fraud detection. So these are the principles underlying level one projects. Uh, this is a slide that shows how this, uh, the components of um, uh, the level one project. Um, so on the bottom of this slide, uh, in the darker uh, shaded area, we have the traditional incumbent banking system uh, that exists pretty much everywhere. On the top lighter shaded uh, uh, area, we have the level one real-time digital payment system that is focused on serving the poor. So uh, we can see there uh, the key components of uh, in the central box, top box of any level one project system. But one, of course, has to do with interoperability. Another we have mentioned has to do with fraud and risk management. And then other shared services can be added profitably uh, to uh, this shared utility on an optional basis, but notably agent and merchant account management uh, uh, features are very, very well served in a shared utility model. We can see, of course, as well that the digital payment system on top also is connected to the banking system on the bottom simply also because, one, because we require interoperability with bank accounts, but also, and perhaps more importantly, because all of the digital payment transactions on the mobile money side need to be settled on inter between providers uh, using um, central bank money uh, in the banking system. So what does a um, level one system look like in reality? Well, as you can see here, it, uh, these are some servers and a control room. So nothing very special about it, except to say that um, uh, technology are, uh, is not the only issue to be solved here. Uh, economics are, is, are important, and we'll talk about that in a second. But also operational excellence and security management are going to be very important in these systems if we want to uh, acquire and conserve the trust of the poor to use it. Um, a few words about uh, the collaboration versus competition. Um, I have already talked uh, about this notion of shared infrastructures. And this slide exemplifies where sharing makes sense where sharing and collaboration makes sense and where um, uh, it does not, where competition uh, plays. So um, looking at level one, the collaboration is really about the rules and governance um, uh, uh, applying to the shared collaborative system. And of course, the rails, the technology that implements um, the interoperability and fraud. And as we said, this is better done shared than on a competitive basis. Now, of course, the competition uh, occurs on the account management feature and all of the rich application 
that we hope uh, will uh, will be created uh, on the payment platform. So we see level one payment platforms not as the end, but really a key milestone to enable a rich set of account uh, management and applications that are diverse and that cater for as many diverse needs of the poor. We talk here about solar, uh, you know, um, leasing solar batteries, uh, loans, uh, insurances, and many other applications that we hope will be created and perhaps the next Uber in the digital uh, uh, financial inclusion space. Let's talk a little bit about the economics of setting up um, a level one uh, real-time system. So here we have a quick glimpse on these economics. Of course, there is the setup cost uh, to set up this, and then there are the operation and maintenance costs. So these figures are quite important because as the, the collaborative effort between commercial providers go on, of course, um, the the um, the economics of the the shared infrastructure will take into account these necessary spending um, in order to achieve uh, uh, scale and interoperability. So I will not dwell into this in much detail. Uh, it's a whole subject in itself, um, and we have numerous studies that that go into many more details. But uh, keep in mind for now that the setup cost is typically between five to $20 million, depending on the complexity um, of, of the endeavor, of course, and that the operation maintenance costs typically are 20% of the setup. So that gives you an indication of uh, the, the setup costs of these real-time payment platforms. I wanted to show you this slide. This is um, uh, illustrating, in fact, the economics of shared platforms. Um, and this particular slide shows you the, it comes from Swift and it shows um, two curves uh, of, uh, of actual observed uh, costs per message and volume of messages on the Swift network from 91 uh, to, to 2015. So you can see how the traffic has uh, and still is exponentially growing over over time. And you can see as as a result, the unit cost of of messaging, which is illustrated in fact by Swift's price to the users of the Swift network, uh, how that how that costs the uh, marginal cost of a message goes down in proportion to the scale. And so this slide captures very much the economics of, um, of uh, real-time shared payment platforms. And it shows that the key important factor for sustainability of such platforms is really the scale and volume on the growth. And so remember, when I was talking about government payments and merchant payments, these are going to be important factors in growing the scale on the on the payment platform. Um, and so, as I was mentioning, uh, this this relatively complex slide from McKinsey shows uh, how people can calculate the break-even point. Um, bit of a shared payment platform as the volume grows. So you can see um, you can see the various uh, comments and scenarios. I don't have the time again to go into this in much detail, but um, uh, I'll leave you with this picture uh, and uh, with the fact that there is much more research and studies done be behind this. Um, just kind of stepping back from financial inclusion for a second, uh, we can observe as well that the demand for real-time payment systems is actually growing around the planet. Uh, the pioneers, as I mentioned, 
uh, have been uh, notably UK faster payment. Australia has a huge project going on. Meanwhile, India also um, uh, has uh, a real-time uh, payment system and China too. So we can see that um, uh, uh, the demand for real-time payment systems is growing across the planet. And on the, cur on the curves, on the right-hand side, you can see the curve uh, the historical curve of the adoption of RTGS systems over time, and we can see how the nascent uh, curve of the real-time payment system is starting to grow, and we expect that it will grow pretty much similarly to the growth of RTGS systems. So this is to say that real-time payment systems are important and probably fundamental for financial inclusion, but uh, that actually uh, these payment systems are beneficial to all economies. Finally, um, I wanted to, in this last part of the talk to, to uh, uh, talk a little bit about regional uh, payment systems. So as you have seen, scale and volume of, um, of payments are going to be crucial in the long-term viability and sustainability of these payment platforms. And so naturally we've been, of course, uh, led to think about how to grow uh, this volume. And one natural way to look at it is of course to combine country efforts into regional efforts. And if you look at Africa, Africa is actually you could see on the left hand side some statistics about Africa, but Africa is interesting because while there is a, a large number of countries with a quite different um, uh, economic and political regimes, nevertheless, there is, uh, and Africa is actually covered by many regional economic um, and uh, political uh, agreements and communities. Uh, and it is a very natural thought to actually grow uh, payment systems beyond countries on a regional basis. Perhaps the most natural, of course, a region to look at in this context would be the YNU, the Western Africa Economic and Monetary Union, which is eight countries, mostly francophone, which actually share a currency, the CFA. So it, there, it's actually very natural to think about growing um, the, uh, the digital payment systems that are there that are currently very siloed to connect them together and then to connect them together on a regional basis. In SADC, the Southern African Development Community, there are efforts going on now to extend the Cyrus system uh, on a multi-currency basis beyond the round and to also connect the cyber system to uh, digital payment systems and mobile money systems. Um, that's a very interesting um, development that will also drive growth. Um, Eastern Africa, of course, is, um, is the, uh, the, the birth country uh, and region of mobile money. Um, and there, uh, the situation is very interesting because there is growing demand for um, cross-currency, cross cross-border, uh, real-time, low-value transactions. So there, there are some studies that tend to um, also look at the economic viability of interconnecting all of these systems together. So. Um, this to say, and uh, we at the Gates Foundation have uh, projects in YMU in, in collaboration with the African Development Bank. We are involved with SADC, and we are financing studies about uh, the Eastern African region. Um, and so it's really a story that is unfolding, uh, but I personally believe that um, not only will this drive further the growth, but perhaps will uh, one day, and this is really uh, my dream, that we 
we actually achieve uh, a, sing a, a continental, continent-wide uh, interconnected payment platform. Um, this talks a little bit about the uh, efforts, more particularly of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So you can see here the eight countries that we specifically work in um, and the partners that uh, we typically tend to work as well with. Um, as I mentioned, we are growing our efforts in uh, uh, regional, regional approaches as well. So I will not dwell on this slide much further. So in summary, um, here is what we are trying to achieve in, in a few words. Everyone benefits from an economy that includes everyone. A recent McKinsey report has looked at the impact on the economies in developing countries if we achieved financial inclusion. And it is an eye-opening report that shows that uh, not only there is a huge opportunity for financial providers to serve the poor, but there is also a huge benefit for the economies and the countries where we work uh, to 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 uh, grow the economies uh, and allow uh, essentially uh, 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 to achieve countrywide benefits while uh, serving uh, also as a poverty alleviation measure. And I will leave you with this. One uh, last slide with, uh, with uh, kind of an optimistic outlook on what we are trying to achieve. Thank you very much. And let's see if there are any questions. Many thanks, Costa. That was great. Uh, I think you gave a very comprehensive overview of the uh, this extremely important project. Um, so. Again, I um, just want to remind you that you're listening to a, um, a presentation from Costa Peric of the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, brought to you by the Columbia Institute for Teleformation and the DFS Observatory at Columbia Business School. So we're going to we're going to head into um, questions for uh, Costa. So you'll see a web chat box. Uh, Michael Wessler is the host. If you could send your questions to him now, and then we'll collate them and and uh, and read them out to, to Costa. So no audio-based questions, please. Um, we're also going to do a poll sh very shortly. Um, so uh, we're going to ask you what your organization type is and how many people are um, uh, viewing the webinar. As I said, there are many people who are, uh, uh, we found, who are, are, are viewing the, uh, the webinars in a room at, uh, simultaneously. So we're going to uh, bring up the polls very shortly. They should be coming up on the right-hand side um, uh, of your screen. Um, OK. Great, there we are. You've got uh, one minute about to answer the poll. So if you are in a room full of people, just ask somebody to step out to the computer and uh, answer the poll. We'd appreciate that. And if you can, just send your questions through to the moderator, um, Michael Wessler. Okay, 15 seconds left. Okay, so first question for Costa um, from Sunil in Bangalore. Um, technically, at a platform level, what would you say needs most improvement uh, in, um, in systems? What, what uh, can you repeat your question, please? Uh, okay, um, I'm just relating it technically at a platform level and a typical TFS platform. 
what um, aspects of the platforms that you've seen uh, need most technical improvement that the, oh, okay. I assume that the level one project yeah. applied to? Yeah, yeah. I think um, uh, there are essentially three in my mind. One has to do with the actual uh, switching uh, of payments. Um, uh, and uh, we've done quite some studies, um, uh, but today the technology uh, is, uh, there are technologies out there that uh, can tremendously help in the scaling of that and distribution. I think the second domain really has to do with inter-provider settlement. Um, and, um, and this is a very, this is a domain that is very prone to slow and cumbersome operations. So there, there is a huge potential improvement, uh, including with su such high advanced technologies such as blockchain inspired uh, domains. And then finally, I think uh, there is this whole notion of ID and mapping of IDs um, between systems uh, that is uh, very important. We know, for example, in India, uh, one way they have solved this, uh, solved this is with having a single ID system with Adhar, with Adhar, which is very successful. But in other countries, there is no single ID, so mapping techniques um, between various IDs are going to be very important. Okay, um, that actually is a segue because uh, you mentioned blockchain. Uh, Pred in Jakarta wants to know what ro uh, blockchain plays in the DFS payment platform, given the number yes. of central banks who are trialing blockchain for their own purposes. Yes, so of, uh, as I mentioned, I think personally that where blockchain makes the most sense is really in this inter-provider settlement. So essentially moving money, um, uh, going from the current system where essentially the payment providers, the digital payment providers have to instruct the banks to move net positions and the banks process that within a day, moving to a system that is distributed and where value can move directly, uh, perhaps in central bank money, is I think um, something that is very well adapted uh, to to technologies such as blockchain or derived from blockchain. Um, when talking about blockchain, I just want to mention one thing. In level one, uh, we uh, strive to to uh, help deploy systems that are attributable. So we need to comply with country and uh, and uh, regional regulations. So we do not advocate for anonymous payment systems such as Bitcoin, um, but we are very uh, open and I think uh, very um, encouraged by uh, blockchain derived technologies that can tremendously help in this domain. And we can, uh, we will um, publish soon in later in October in the context of Cybos. Uh, the Cybos conference will publish some early results of some detailed uh, discussions on this topic. Yeah, I think I think the other wrinkle, of course, is the encryption. A lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, blockchain um, systems are U.S. derived, and there are uh, export restrictions on the yeah. technology. Yeah, the difficulty with the main difficulty with blockchain, which we are we have been working to circumvent, is that the blockchain systems tend to assume a single blockchain that is worldwide, which obviously is not adapted to the context of country and regional payment systems, as you say, Leon, because of uh, 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 privacy issues. So we have been looking at how to circumvent that while benefiting from the other beneficial uh, characteristics of blockchain, such as scalability, distribution, and crypto-based um, um, transactions. I, I mean, you made a good point on the blockchain and settlement. I think uh, just to expand on that, uh, some, some of the blockchains, especially like the R3 Corda, uh, allow you a discrete look at liquidity positions. Uh, just for their transaction, but like what's done, uh, you know, not with blockchain, but certainly in, in Mexico, 
Yeah. Uh, which which means that um, for interoperability purposes, you don't need to have a huge amount of collateral. You just need to have uh, a visible liquidity for purposes of setting the one transaction that you're about to undertake, which which improves uh, liquidity positions all around for especially the smaller providers. Yeah. If, if, I, 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 if, yeah. Um, okay. Um, so Jose, <laughs> interestingly. Uh, Jose in Mexico City, uh, and hope, hope everything's okay there in Mexico City, Jose. Uh, I know you mentioned a governance of a platform, but what role do you think regulators like central banks should play in national payment platforms for DFS? Should there be technical mandates or just principles that need to be applied by the service provider participants in DFS? Yeah. So uh, I think it can be both. We have seen uh, situations where the central bank uh, does um, both of the of the functions that can be envisioned. So one is, of course, uh, driving the creation and of the rules and governance uh, related rules for the payment system itself. And the second possible role is to actually operate the the system itself. Uh, I I think that most central banks will be uh, will be driven to the first role. We have seen cases, Jordan, for example, and their Jamo Pay system is a good case where the central bank has endorsed the operational role, uh, but for a limited period of time, uh, with the view that the private sector should take that role later on. Uh, so, so there are multiple roles, but I think the key role of the central bank uh, as they are mostly also the regulator, has to do with setting up uh, the uh, and clearing the way for the creation of a real-time payment system, its associated rules and governance. Okay, uh, thanks, Costa. From Abdul in Cairo, how many countries do you think exactly match the principles of level one? So today, um, I know of of three systems that are close to all of the principles in level one. Um, uh, there is the system in Peru that's called BIM. Uh, there is a system in Jordan called Jamope. And then we are looking into the details of the IMPS and uh, UPI system in India, which implements most of the rules as well. These are the ones we are aware of. Egypt, interestingly, is a very hotbed country for innovation in this. And I'm, I'm not entirely sure of uh, how it is in detail ongoing, but I know that there is a lot of effort. So we are looking uh, to make a case study in Egypt eventually and see uh, how the things are going on there. But since the uh, person is uh, from Egypt, I wanted to mention that uh, there is a lot of things happening in Egypt right now. But I wouldn't be able to say if it's compliant to align with the level one principles yet. And then, of course, there are some systems um, uh, that are deemed faster payment system, notably the UK one. Uh, but of course, the, the UK faster payment system is not accessible from simple mobile phones. So in that way, it's quite different. But some of the principles uh, of level one are uh, actually inspired by the UK faster payment system. Okay, um, we've got a lot of questions coming through. I don't think we're going to get through all of them because we've got seven minutes left. Uh, from Jeffrey Bauer, I think he's uh, in London. I'm in agreement with all the principles and see the value of shared technology, but as someone who professionally works to enable collaboration in payments, I'm fully aware that the technology and platform is often the least challenging part of the business development process. Can you talk about how you actually achieve consensus to co collaborate to get the partners to even begin discussing what system they should work together to design? Yeah, so I, I agree as well that technology um, uh, is a um, necessary component, but not sufficient. Um, I think that um, there is a couple of things that are helping the dynamic uh, of, uh, of this. First of all, um, as you all know, there is a now huge emphasis through the uh, UN Global Development Goals to, for the governments to uh, 
embark on financial inclusion so we can see that more and more governments uh, regulators are taking a more active role and sometimes more directive role in in guiding the private sector going on. Um, the second dynamic that is happening, which I see a lot, is also that commercial players are starting to realize that um, that the market is too fragmented and that there is some uh, interoperability and consolidation needed. And so I can see, and we are invited by uh, private sector players to convene efforts to, uh, to essentially create shared platforms. As I mentioned, we haven't yet achieved, uh, you know, uh, mixing oil with water, <laughs> because of course, uh, when you talk about banking communities and alcohol communities, they are quite different, but we can see very large efforts going on individually in these communities and then we can see the first signs of actually understanding to need the need to interoperate uh, on an industry level so i agree that it is hard um, and perhaps one of the biggest roles of organizations like the gates foundation but also afi and btca and the united nations is probably driving towards that because that's i think the last mile difficulty that we really have so i wholeheartedly agree that this is hard but i can see i'm optimistic that uh, economic factors and governmental drive will will get us there Um, one more question. What does a decent size or scale look like for an emerging market that seeks to implement level one? What does a uh, decent scale? Size uh, and scale, yeah. Size and scale. Um, so I would say, um, uh, I would say that if we have three or four incumbent financial providers, gathering up i think that's enough that's enough to get the ball rolling um so um on on the interoperability side of things so of course um as you have seen from the economics piece of the equation um it is very important to grow volume very fast for uh economically sustaining this um, and I have seen projections in some projects that we have going that um, in, in relatively small countries that two years is uh, something that is achievable in terms of getting to self-sustainability. Okay, thank you. Uh... Thank you very much, uh, Costa, uh, again. Um... With great pleasure. Thank you for all your questions. I think if you, uh, what we'll do is, because I think we've got about 20 more questions that we need to get through, and obviously we're out of time, uh, we'll send them to uh, Costa, and if you've got anything else, send them through to us, and we'll, we'll pass them on to uh, Costa, um, and uh, he can reply um, uh, later. Um, so... Thank you again from uh, to everybody who participated. Uh, we actually have a few hundred people on this uh, webinar, very popular um, around the world, um, and invite you to uh, to the next webinar, which is October 6th on competition in DFS. Um, and just a reminder to look out for the uh, quiz email. Um, regarding this webinar, you have two hours. The, the quiz email should actually be in the email that was sent out for the webinar. Oh, thank you, Michael. Uh, so you have two hours to complete in multiple questions. Again, if you've been attentive to uh, cost of the slides, you should get it through it quite easily. And um, we'll see what the results are. So again, uh, thank you for participating, and it's a goodbye to you all around the world from New York City.
we'll see you next time.